Welcome to all of it. We got all of it. All of it. <laughs> all of <laughs> it. <laughs> Our guest is Secretary Madeleine Albright, Brian Cranston, Tank and the Bangas, Barry Jenkins, Celia Keenan Bolger, Aaron Lee Carr, Esperanza Spalding, Gideon Glick, Helen Yoyemi, Fab Five Freddy, Benga Akanabe, Brene Brown, Tony Goldwyn, Tandy Newton, Jake Jill. <laughs> Welcome to all of it. Thank you so much for joining us. Hello. What a pleasure. Hi. Hi. This is so fun. I'll see you tomorrow. We're here every day, 12 to 2. The impromptu concert. I love it. I love it. I love it. I was there for the love of it. You must tell the truth. I'm sure everyone's perspective is unique. There's a lot of truth about the pain of being an immigrant, mm -hmm. but they're jokes. We find the funny. It's our strength. At what point do you think women's health care will stop being a political issue? When half of Congress can get pregnant. Okay. Ran out of words, but we do what we do. We mm. don't have no words, so we got to trade twos. So we trade twos, all this really dope groove. And Allison was so nice to meet you. It is so nice to see you all. Welcome to the April Get Lit with All of It book club event with Jennifer Egan. Thank you all for turning down your Met Gala tickets tonight to be with us here in the audience, live in the green space. So good to see you. It's our first time here in nearly two years. So we're a little bit rusty, but we're, we're excited. We're gonna have a great time tonight. Also wanna make sure we wave to the folks who are watching on the live stream in their sweatpants. Good for you. A couple hundred of you out there. Um, it, it's a great night. We always say that Get Lit is, not, is more like a book party in a book club because we always have music tonight grammy winner steve earl is here <laughs> amazing and if you hang around till the end we'll let you know what our next month i guess this month may book is and jennifer egan will also be signing books after the event and they will be for sale in the lobby so Let's get to it. She is a Pulitzer Prize winning author of A Visit from the Goon Squad, a journalist, a New Yorker. She's our April Get Lit with All of It book club author. And thanks to our partners at the New York Public Library, 4,000 people checked out a copy of her novel, The Candy House. We are thrilled that Jennifer is with us tonight. Jennifer, come on out. It is lovely to see you in person. I feel the same. <laughs> it's great to be here. When did you know you wanted to write about memory? Well, that's interesting. You know, I, I think in a way I've always been writing about memory, but in different ways. I think my first novel is very much about nostalgia, kind of overtly. And then I felt like I didn't want to write about nostalgia anymore. I felt like I'd sort of exhausted that topic. But when I wrote A Visit from the Goon Squad, I knew that I wanted to write about time. Hmm. which, of course, is another way of approaching memory. Um, although I didn't actually think of it that way. I, I was thinking of it in the sense that, in a way, every novel is about time. And mm -hmm. in, in a way, you could I think you could say any piece of fiction is about time. Even if it's a very short unit of time, the, the, the nature of fiction is that it's looking at change in some sense over time, even if that unit of time is just a day or, mm -hmm. or a minute. Uh, and so I love the idea of writing a book that was explicitly about time as its subject, and there are some other great novels that have done that. Um, so I guess I keep coming at memory. I mean, memory is what fiction writers are always using, even if we don't, as it is my case, ever write about ourselves knowingly. Um, I'm using, in my case, especially times and places that I know, mm -hmm. and extrapolating from my own experiences um, to, into lives that feel very different from mine, and that I usually think have nothing at all to do with me, but later <laughs> people point out, and sometimes I see it too, <laughs> there are a few similarities. How has your relationship with time changed in the past two years? That's, it's fascinating. I mean, um, I keep feeling like the, the past few years both haven't happened and also like nothing before them happened. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it, it feels like it's, it's definitely messed with my perception of time, but I don't know if I fully understand how. I think too, you know, I thought about the Candy House as being explicitly about space in the way that Goon Squad was about mm -hmm. time. And I was really interested in how virtual experience has changed our relationship mm -hmm. to space and how the, even the word space seems to mean very different things that, and certainly not always a concrete place. And the pandemic really made me think even more about that because so much of 
the space we used to quote unquote meet in was virtual space. With this idea of own your unconscious, this sort of trapper keeper of, me of memories, uh, we asked our book club members if they would want to do that, if they, would, if they could, if they could keep their memories and save them. 85% of the people in our book club said yes. I'm not surprised. I would do it. You would? Oh, tell me why you would do it. <laughs> well, because, you know, the whole idea of, of this device, own your unconscious, is that you can finally actually take stock of your entire consciousness. And it's interesting, I thought of it more in terms of consciousness than memory, but of course they're exactly the same thing. Um, my writing process relies completely on my ability to somehow get beyond what I consciously know. What I consciously know is not good enough, not interesting enough, and definitely not original enough. So I'm looking to, in an almost meditative state, a kind of blind improvisational way, get beyond what I know. So that presupposes that, you know, if I could externalize everything onto a cube, I would find some useful stuff. <laughs> yeah. So when you, I, that's interesting, you said like, a, you, do you go into a zone when you write? I mean, I think I do a little in the sense that, um, well, first of all, I use handwriting for fiction, and that's helpful for a number of reasons. One is that, Handwriting is, is, has a kind of physical, almost meditative quality to it. It also is much harder to read handwriting than it is letters on a screen, and especially if your handwriting looks like mine. Um, <laughs> so it adds to the blindness of it and the sense of going forward. You know, if you're writing on a screen, uh, for me, and I, as a journalist, I use mm -hmm. only a computer to write, um, writing is rewriting in the moment. Like, I see a sentence, nope. I'm backing up, I'm fixing it. With handwriting, if you take the pen off the paper, you've interrupted something. And so it's easier to measure whether that's happening. And I try to just keep going forward. And I don't actually read over what I've done until the next day to re-enter that flow. Um, and, and then I keep going. So I think it really is a lot like improvisation in that I'm looking for a kind of a, a line of action or, or or uh, drama or something that feels alive and just leaning into that and really trying to push forward with it as opposed to backing up. It's so interesting. So for nonfiction, you use a computer, but for fiction, you handwrite, long, hand, long form. Yes. Huh. That's really neat. Um, the title of the book, The Candy House, it comes from Hansel and Gretel. This one part of it is, uh, if anybody at home hasn't read it yet, I'm going to read it for you. Um, it says, the, the, the person who, the, the kids who are saying this say, we contemplated a nationwide billboard campaign to remind people of that eternal law. Nothing is for free. Only children expect otherwise, even as myth and fairy tales warn us. Rumpelstiltskin, King Midas, Hansel and Gretel, never trust a candy house. It was only a matter of time before someone made them pay for what they thought they were getting for free. Why could nobody see this? What did you want to examine about this idea that we think perhaps we can get something for free? Perhaps there won't be consequences. Well, I think it's human nature that we, we grab for what we want in the moment. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to technology, the consequences become obvious much, sometimes much later. I mean, think about the combustion engine. You know, by the time we figured out what some of the consequences of that were, we were so reliant on it that it, we, we, have, we can't extrica mm -hmm. extricate ourselves. So I guess I was interested in that kind of, that combination of desire and curiosity. You know, all the things that, going back to Hansel and Gretel, lead them into the candy house. Um, and then, and then the, the kind of um, pulling back and recognizing the complexities of what having that thing actually involves. And the context of the, the piece that you read is actually um, going back to Napster. So mm -hmm. these two women are record company executives, or the daughter, daughters of a record company owner, who are horrified by what is, they, can, they can see is happening to the music industry because of Napster, which was maybe the first kind of internet sharing of the model that we now accept as being quite normal, which is you give to get. Mm -hmm. You give access to your songs to get access to other people's songs, and the, the lure is it's free. 
But I think that, you know, of course, that was before any of us really understood that there were different kinds of economies, like an attention economy mm -hmm. or a data economy. So, um, but, but the truth is that in that moment, and this is kind of back to my writing process, I was just, I, I remember the moment of writing that, and, and I was just kind of hurtling forward. And I love the idea that there was a saying in the world that I was writing about, never trust mm -hmm. a candy house. I thought, yeah, that's, that's kind of a good saying. Um, and you know, these, these girls think that somehow they're gonna stop people from using Napster, which is also kind of comic, especially mm -hmm. looking back. Um, when Napster almost seems quaint compared to some of the bargains that <laughs> we've made since. Um, so it, there, there's no judgment there. You know, I, I am a very curious person myself, and I understand the power of curiosity. Mm -hmm. There's another character in The Candy House who talks about how impossible it is to resist curiosity over time. You can resist it in a minute, you can resist mm -hmm. it for a year, but it, eventually you'll succumb, and I'm, I'm the embodiment of that. I mean, fiction writing is all about indulging my curiosity about other people's lives. I thought it was interesting that you waited till the end of the book to give us the list of positives that could come from having our memories in the cloud and accessing our memories. You write tens of thousands of crimes solved, child pornography all but eradicated, Alzheimer's and dementia sharply reduced by reinfusions of saved, healthy consciousness, dying languages preserved and revived, a legion of missing persons found, a global rise of empathy that accompanied a drastic decline in purist orthodoxies. I, I'm curious why you waited toward the end of the, the novel well, that that list comes up in the context of, you know, by the by the end of the novel, there's a strong resistance to this technology, which lets people not just externalize their consciousnesses. In a way, that's not the controversial part. It's the sharing, <laughs> which means that even people who haven't shared their consciousnesses are represented in this collective consciousness because so many people have, much in the way that with DNA sharing now, even if we haven't shared our DNA results or even gotten any, we are findable because of the number of people in North America who have. So, um, yeah, so, so it, there's a resistance to this technology and, the, and Mandala, the company that produced it, the son of the inventor, feels that, he, that they need to remind people of all the good things this technology has produced. Um, some of which were probably motivations for people to, mm -hmm. uh, to engage it in in the first place, although I think curiosity was probably the primary one. I mean, I do show people using the technology in mm -hmm. all kinds of ways, not always with terrible results. I mean, there's one guy who um, wants to see what has happened to a, a guy who was selling him drugs at an earlier point when he was in active mm -hmm. addiction and using a product called, hey, whatever happened to, um, he's able to <laughs> think hard about Damon, this drug dealer, uh, mm -hmm. and, and thereby sharing those particular memories to the collective. And then through facial recognition, uh, he's able to see what has happened to Damon. And honestly, that idea of writing a chapter in which people could do that came before the technology that I ended up coming up with. I, that, hmm. that machine, Own Your Unconscious, came into the picture very late in writing this book. I knew what I wanted to do narratively long before I had invented something that would justify doing it. But I was thinking, you know, wouldn't it be so cool if people could find out what had happened to people that they don't have enough identifying information about to actually find using, say, social media, which is not very hard to do. And of course, that comes from my sometimes thinking of glancing encounters from years ago and thinking, who is that person? Again, back to curiosity. Mm -hmm. What are their lives like now? Um, how could I write something in which people can do that? And the answer was I, I needed some occasion. And ultimately, the machine became the, the occasion or the, the kind of logical context in which that's possible. The book starts with Bix, who we meet in the Goon Squad. He's a, he's a very minor character in Goon Squad. Uh, we meet up with him in the beginning. He's sort of trying to figure out what's going to be the next big thing. We know he goes to this party, realizes this idea. Um, but I thought it was so interesting the way you wrote him as this rock star tech guy. You know, and, we th and when we think about Elon and we say Jack, and 
Mark, <laughs> we know all these these guys. By I think first tech guys are kind of our, our newest rock stars, let's say. Why, why do you think people have these obsessions? That's an interesting question. Um, I mean, that, you know, I think it must have something to do with the degree to which these technologies permeate our lives and change them, you know, much as I mean, the discovery of rock music fell to many people, and I think it has ever since defined, say, one's teenage years. Like, what, what music describes your life to you and makes mm. you feel like you even know yourself better because you're listening to this music? For me, it was Patti Smith. Um, but I think, in a way, maybe technology does that just as much now. You know, it... it it's so much more, obviously, than you know, a thing we use to do A, B, or C. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a complexity of interaction and connection and even self-definition. Like I've noticed that when I talk to people who are in their early 20s, so to me, that's like a very young person, <laughs> they talk about people who are, say, 15 as, as having a more technological savvy than they have. It feels mm. like everyone feels a little old because there's always something new, and the people who came up with that new thing are more conversant in it. And the inventors of all this, the, the kind of um, figureheads of all of it, are tech people. So uh, maybe, maybe that's, they are cultural figures in that way. They're providing us with definitional technology that, that, that defines us generationally mm -hmm. and interacts with our lives in so many ways. I'm curious, we're about the same vintage. So we have, have lived half of our life with the internet, our adult life, and half of our adult life without it. Was that helpful to you in writing this book? Well, it's interesting. So I think about this all the time. Um, I, when I went to college, there was no telecommunications development that I was aware of other than call waiting. And call exactly. waiting was huge. Don't get me wrong. Like when I was a teenager, we had to get a second phone line <laughs> because no one could get a phone call because I was always on the phone. Um, so these developments are always major. And then the answering machine, you know, no more saying to someone, oh, I called you and the line was busy. Uh-uh. Or I called you when you weren't home. Um, How about beepers? Come on. Yeah, exactly. Beepers. The beepers. Um, so I do think that I am very grateful for the amount of time that I spent with none of this mm -hmm. and the my you know having at, reached and lived well into adulthood without the internet absolutely I feel like it just helps me to not take these things for granted and also I'm kind of a late adopter and a, a rather incompetent adopter frankly so I'm really the the person who's the last to embrace whatever it is um, and maybe that's about Again, just maintaining the perspective of before and after each new thing. Let's talk about authenticity. It's it's really important in the book and important to characters in the book and also fo folds into this idea of social media. Are you presenting your authentic self? Are you presenting your curated life? Yes. Um, a character named Rebecca writes her big research paper on authentic authenticity and concludes authenticity as problemati problematized by digital experience, am I saying that right? Um, and the character of Alfred is obsessed with eliciting authentic reactions, so he just screams in public to see what happens. Um, what is Alfred actually looking for? Is he really looking for authenticity or? I think he is looking for authenticity. I, I mean, the, the, but he, it, it's an absurd way <laughs> of living. I mean, you know, I think we can argue that the price he's paying and forcing others mm -hmm. to pay for his authentic <laughs> experience is too high because he's freaking out and terrifying everyone, you know, alienating his family. Um, I'm fascinated by our cultural fascination with authenticity because the very fact that we're so interested in it is a sign that it feels a little bit um, hard to find. Mm -hmm. And there's a book that had a huge impact on me called The Image by Daniel Borston, published in 1961 and pretty outdated in many ways now. But the gist of his theory it, and he's really just talking about television, this is before mass media, is that mediated experience, meaning television in his case, and, and, the, and the kind of pseudo events that are created for television and other media, um, these experiences feel inauthentic. They feel mediated, they, and of course they are. 
And that creates a longing for authenticity as an antidote to this artificiality. And then mass media tries to satisfy mm -hmm. that craving by providing what feels more authentic, but of course often is even more mediated to achieve that sense of authenticity. That felt like such a true observation and so early. I mean, he's writing about the 1950s, and I really feel that it explains, or it's a lens through which we can look meaningfully at a lot of things, right through streaming, mm -hmm. TikTok videos. I, I mean, this longing for authenticity is very real, but looking to screens to provide it is, is in a way, um, it's sort of ironic and, and ultimately, I think, always unsatisfying in the end. What was the last authentic encounter you had? Well, I mean, you know, I, I, any encounters, this is an authentic okay. encounter, you know, and I'm so glad we're not on Zoom mm -hmm. because I think it's more authentic because we're not, actually. Um, so I think anything in person has a tremendous authenticity. And... Um, and, and, you know, that being said, again, my goal is not to judge. And I, look, when my son explained to me what memes were um, and, and took me on a little tour through how fascinating it is to watch something be transformed by it, through the, the perspective and the technology of a whole array of people, I was totally fascinated. I thought, oh, okay, thank you. I get mm -hmm. why this is really interesting. And, and that was an authentic experience. So who's to say? I guess that's what I'm saying. We, I, no one is in the position to say whose experience is authentic and not. But I will just say this, and it may be generational. To me, screens are dulling. I, I mm -hmm. don't like them. I feel drained by them, um, even though they have that promise of light and shininess and there's a, an attraction to them, I usually feel emptier after I'm on a screen for very long. And maybe that's just me, but that it never feels enriching in, that, in the way that I'm, I, I like. <laughs> I want to let you all know in about 10 minutes we're going to take audience questions, so get your, your questions ready for Jennifer. What is a section of this novel when, you're working on, when you were working on it that just wasn't working? Oh my gosh. Well, the chapter that is in, uh, elect in the form of electronic communications, we're not really sure what they are, it's, it could be Slack or texting or email, mm -hmm. that was the last effort of many mis <laughs> misdirected efforts to find a way to tell the story of what happens to Lulu, whom we meet first uh, as, a, as a friend at a country club, as a kid, then as a spy and a kind of genre story. Um, and I knew that I wanted to, to somehow, I, I felt I couldn't just leave her at the end of this spy story, partly because it's so stylized and genre-esque, and I felt I have to sort of bring her back into the world as we know it. Um, and so I tried all kinds of things because I knew that in a way, what happens to her on the spy mission, although it is written in a stylized way, and I'm not focusing intensely on this, to put it in modern parlance, I would say it's very traumatic. I mean, mm -hmm. she, is, she is raped, she is shot. I mean, terrible things happen to her. And we're not focusing that much on that in that piece, but I thought, mm -hmm. okay, I have to reckon with that. What happens to this woman? It's, she's, a, she's a wreck, that's what happens. What do I do, how do I find my way to that? Originally I thought, so the spy story is written in, was written for Twitter at 140 characters in these very short um, list-like structural units in which she is narrating her, the lessons she learns from each thing that's happening to her. And I thought, okay, I'm gonna write another chapter in that same form, and the idea is she can't stop thinking this way, and it's driving her insane. I thought it was a great idea, and the fact that I thought it was a great idea is a, a perfect example of why th my ideas are not good enough. <laughs> it was bad. <laughs> and I, I, I spewed out countless pages of this, maybe 100. I thought, how can it be bad when it's such a good idea? Well, <laughs> ideas only get you so far. So then I thought, okay, I'm gonna let this go. I have a new idea. I'm gonna write this piece from the point of view of the therapist who treats Lulu in the aftermath of her spy mission in the form of therapist notes. Another great idea. 
uh, that went nowhere. And so I, I thought, I don't know what I'm going to do ab about her. But I also knew that I really wanted an epistolary chapter, mm -hmm. a chapter in the form of letters. And it was somehow, as I, as I flailed and waited and kept returning to this idea of Lulu, I began to feel like that was going to be the arena in which to tell the story. And it helped me to understand what was really missing from the earlier efforts hmm. that went wrong. And that was humor. They were humorless. And for mm -hmm. some reason, I needed humor to, to do what I needed to do with Lulu. And I also needed an ensemble cast, which is about as far from being inside her head, listening to her thoughts as you could be. So I, f I kind of fought my way to it. What does that feel like for you that if you've written 100 pages and you get to the end of it and realize, I, I can't use this? It's, it is not a great feeling. I mean, I've, <laughs> it's, it's, you know, and, and, it, and it's hard because the more time I've put in, the less I want to let it go. But mm. one thing I've really learned is if I feel relief walking away, if I feel like, mm. oh, I've been released from this, that's a sign that I actually really have to let it go. If, if, curi if curiosity is not bringing me back to it, I have to just let it go. And another thing I've really learned is that things are, time is not really wasted in this way. It mm -hmm. feels like it. But often it's that I haven't, I haven't waited long enough or found the right way to do certain things that I want to do. And so I've seen enough resurrections over the years of old material that felt like a failure because I couldn't use it to, to feel a little more faith when I put things aside that maybe I will revisit them. And honestly, I'm so relieved if I can just make anything work that I feel like, okay, I, I, hundreds of pages, no problem. At least this finally has legs, you know? Um, and I, I just want to mention one more thing, which is on my new website for the Candy House, I've really tried to r expose this process. Mm. So um, on the front page, you can actually look at the published version of each chapter, the first page. And if you hover over the first paragraph, it dissipates and you're looking at a marked up manuscript of that same paragraph. And if you hover again, you get back to the first draft of the first paragraph with the date and everything. And in certain chapters like that one, you can go further into the failed earlier efforts, the first iterations of those. So I feel like I, I like to talk about this because there is a lot of failure in, in this process. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's not really failure if it works out in the end. And I'm always really trying to encourage people not to give up. You know, that trial and error is a really useful methodology. Um, it's kind of how I work. It sounds authentic. I <laughs> so. uh, how did you keep track of all the different characters and how they intersect? I picture you like the character in Homeland with red strings <laughs> and a map and making um, You know, I didn't need to keep track of, of how pe of people's histories exactly, mm -hmm. because in a way it's almost like people we know. You know, we just sort of have a part of our brain where we store that information of how people are connected to each other. The, the real challenge was remembering when everyone was born and what age all of them would be at any particular time. And that did require color coding. Um, <laughs> and I also, you know, p uh, there are a number of characters who have the same age, and that was just to, I tried to have at least two people in each specific age, year of birth, just to try to keep things organized for myself, but I had a timeline. The oldest character is Lou Klein, the record mm -hmm. producer, uh, born in 1930. And so from 1930 on, with, for every decade, I had a very clear record of who was born, what year, and what year everyone who had already been born, what their age would have been in that decade. Um, and that, I used that a lot. I had to have that with me all the time. Because I would suddenly think, oh, wouldn't it be interesting if these two characters intersected? And I would have to remind myself, well, they're 20 years apart in age, mm -hmm. so uh, let's think about how they're going to intersect because it, it may not happen so naturally. Another thread running through the book is attempt to understand one's parents. Uh, whether it's looking back at their memories of the record executive father or trying to figure out that weird feud a mother has with the neighbor, one of my favorite, favorite <laughs> parts of the book. Um, 
what is behind some of these characters' drive to understand their parents and get in the minds of their parents? That's such a that's an interesting question. I mean, I you know, in in exploring space, sort of back to my original idea, um, I'm very interested in how in perspective, which is another way of really describing space. You know, where we are in space affects our perspectives and. Each chapter in this book is from a different perspective, mm -hmm. as with A Visit from the Goon Squad. And the relationship between a parent and a kid, or I guess the way we see our parents, let's say, is so both so rich but also so limited. I feel like we will never, I, I should just say personally, I, I don't feel like I can ever see my parents in the way that someone that they would meet in their own age group would. It feels impossible. Mm -hmm. Now, part of that, you know, my father was killed in an accident, actually, when he was my age. So, and I didn't grow up with him. So there may be also an element of a sense of really insoluble mystery around mm -hmm. him. And there's a lot of looking for fathers in my books, you know, even though I hate repeating myself, that does come up. Um, so it may be that that ex even exacerbates my curiosity mm -hmm. about the difference between the way that parents and children see each other and the way that people they meet out in the world see them. So I think all of that is true. And then also, you know, my kids were basically growing up in the years that I was working on the candy house. They were, they were like seven and nine when I started working on it because I worked on it on and off over a long period and now they're both in college. And in a way, although I don't write about myself directly, I think my parenting experience is really embedded in here. Mm. Um, and I think the two clues are probably baseball. There's a lot of baseball. I was a baseball mom, um, and also uh, Dungeons and Dragons, which one of my kids was really into. And I did a lot of thinking about both of those enterprises because I was I was surrounded by them, and uh, and so I guess I was just in my veiled way, uh, which is as close as I ever get to writing about myself, ruminating on the experience of of parenthood. It's one. Of, it's interesting. I thought about it in the way that if anybody's parents have passed away and you clean out their home, you discover things about your parents. You find love letters. You find, you know, uh, swizzle sticks from some cocktail party <laughs> they went to. And you have to think about them in a, in a different way. And I can remember when I did this thinking, I, maybe I shouldn't read this letter. Like, I'm a snoop. Maybe I shouldn't be snooping in my parents' memories. It feels almost like you're crossing a boundary that shouldn't be crossed. I, I know what you mean because mm -hmm. my grandparents, I, I have my grandparents' love letters to each other, and they were, you know, very reserved people. And my, you know, my grandmother was writing about how, you know, she wore her short shorts on the tennis court, <laughs> and, you know, and clearly to make my grandfather jealous. Um, and I, I, again, I just thought, really, grandma? <laughs> In short shorts? Wow. Uh, but it feels a little, it feels, it feels somehow maybe a tiny bit wrong. But at the same time, you want to read them. Of course. Of course. <laughs> Curiosity. <laughs> <laughs> Should we get some microphones uh, out to the audience to see if there are uh, any questions? In the back. Hi, thank you, and insert all the fangirling, all the fangirling. Um, I'm just um, I'm really curious, I mean, we talked a little bit about, you've talked a little bit about memory. I'm, I'm really curious about redemption and, and second chances and the opportunity to reinvent yourself. And that seems like a through line in so many of your wonderful characters, and I'd love for you to talk about that for a moment. Yeah, well, I'm, reinvention is always really interesting to me because it, I'm fascinated by identity and the way that identity interacts with technology and also the way that there's something, I think, sort of American about the idea of self-reinvention. I mean, mm -hmm. we were a country where, and hopefully will always be, where people come from elsewhere to reimagine their lives and, and, and um, live in a new way that might not be possible where they were. Um, and so I'm just interested in that as a subject. It's, it's fascinating to me. Um, but I think also, you know, I, I, in, there is a lot of redemption in this book, almost to a degree that surprised me. 
I think there are a few reasons for it. I mean, one was some of the characters that I am, I'm writing about who are minor characters in Goon Squad uh, or, or even major felt in that book like they were in some ways on a downward trajectory or we saw them in, in, a, in a low point. And I'm, I, I, to me, the only interesting thing to do if I'm gonna revisit them is something different. <laughs> I mean, I'm not interested in just making the same point again and again or describing the same experience again and again. And in a way, a, a creative tendency that I have is once I've established something, whatever it is, my impulse is to kind of push against it, try to go the other way. Why not do more? Because I've already done that. So. I somehow that really ended up carrying the day in this book, which was really surprising because in some ways I felt very discouraged in some of the years I was working mm -hmm. on it. I mean, the, in the early chapters that I wrote, you know, Obama was in office. Um, I felt full of a lot of hope for American life. When I returned to it, it was 2016 and there was so much division. I'm inc incredibly, um, you know, fixated on the climate crisis. So I have a lot of worries, but I, what I discovered writing this is that I also have so much faith in human beings to solve our problems. I really, really do. There are a lot of things standing in our way. We stand in our own way, but I really do think that working together, we are capable of, of amazing things, and that is a great thing. That was a great thing for me to remember. I, don't, I didn't know I thought it <laughs> um, until I wrote this book, uh, and um, it was just nice. Maybe it was just what I needed at that, at that moment. That's a great question. Thanks. Over here. And then we'll get to you, sir. Uh, thanks so much for this wonderful conversation. Um, so in a lot of points in the book, we get um, Oh, well, essentially the main drama, it seems to hinge upon how this technology uh, changes the way people relate to society and whether they want to tune in or drop out effectively. And I was wondering if you could speak a bit more to how the technology changes people's relationships with themselves on an identity level, on a linguistic level, on a the, uh, like general existential level. We get flashes of it with you know Miranda saying she's tired of her history. Mm -hmm. And we see Roxy's uh, fascination with this new secret life after she uploads her consciousness where everything before then is known and now she has this new fresh take. Um, I thought those were brilliant but they, they seemed a bit more um, one-off than this general like relationship with society thematic element so I'd love to hear more of speaking to that element or not to make it such a run-on but at the end of Goon Squad we get this left turn of how language is affected by time and technology moving forward. Um, so yeah, I'd love to hear more about the individual relationship with it. That's interesting. Well, I, you're right. There isn't a lot about that. And I, I think, I wonder whether part of it is that, I mean, I guess what we see, the, 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 the final, um, we see people not using language at all, but actually through touching each other, through this product called Skin to Skin, actually being able to jointly sort of, in a sense, meld their consciousnesses. Now, I can't think of anything more awful, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really? Uh, no. I, I, so it may be that, that, that in fact, it's, it's very hard to, I mean, to back up, this, this machine was useful to me narratively, but it's a little bit hard to really imagine how it would function in a real way in the world, except to the degree that we already know the answer, because it's not all that far from what the internet already does. It, it combines a, a huge quantity of information about us, information that we have shared, into a roiling collective that, that is tremendously revealing if someone is looking carefully. And I'm not even talking about the data counters or any of that, or surveillance per se. I'm just talking about what we can know about each other from the internet. How does that change interactions um, between people? I mean, sometimes it means that, that a conversation is almost repetitive because people can already, I mean, what do you say to someone when you already know their whole history, for example? 
Um, which is why you know I don't really like to Google people, for example. I would just much rather hear about them <laughs> from them. Um, but it may be that that the in terms of really understanding how this machine would change people's relationships to themselves, I, I, it may be that the answer is that I don't really know, and that's why I don't actually portray it. Um, because there are all kinds of questions that I, I get away with not really answering, like what does it mean to, down, to, to download your consciousness? What is consciousness exactly? What about all the thoughts and, and all the perceptions? And I mean, when I was teaching at Penn, I had my class write down, I wanted them to see all the things that were in their consciousness in one moment. So we, I said, what do you hear? Is there a song in your head? What are you worrying about? What are you looking forward to? Hmm. What are you afraid of? And you know, the idea was no one's ever gonna see this because I just wanted them to notice all of the different trains of thought and perception that were alive in their minds at one time. What does it really mean to actually view all of that? Viewing doesn't describe it. So it may be that there's a way in which this machine dissipates if we look too closely at it. Um, and, and you may be fixing upon that. And you know, in a way, the machine, in the end, is, is the book. <laughs> that's what is actually, that's the, the consciousness roaming that's actually taking place in the course of the novel. It's me going in and out of people's minds and describing their, their inner lives. And I think we had a question down front. Did you have a question, sir? Yeah. I was just wondering when you um, conceived of Candy House vis-a-vis -vis Goon Squad. I mean, was it in your head while you were writing Goon Squad? I read the books backwards, so I don't know if that was <laughs> right or wrong. But you like it. You said it might be good to read yeah, them I think it. Yeah, I think it might actually be better to read them backwards. <laughs> I'm not sure. I mean, there's, you know, in a way, there's no forward and backward in books in which chronology is not an organizing principle. Um, I was already working on the chapter called Lulu the Spy on my book tour for A Visit from the Goon Squad. So I think I never really stopped imagining and, and being curious about these people. And part of it is that when each chapter is its own center and each life, of course, has its own cast of characters, there's a kind of infinite possibility there. Um, also, because of the amount of times that first draft material never really worked, which is in, for the Candy House about 50% maybe, and for Goon Squad maybe a third. I was left knowing more about my characters than I was able to share with the reader, which created a sense of, of, it, of unfinishedness uh, that was that, and open-endedness that I think was an invitation for me to just continue imagining in that realm. So the earliest stuff goes back to 2010, 2012, 2013. The, the thing I didn't know for sure at all was whether I would actually collect it into a book because I figured, you know, I could just publish these pieces individually as I did with the Lulu the Spy chapter. Um, it was titled Black Box. Uh, I, I would only, I knew that I would only create a book if it could really be its own thing and about different things than Goon Squad was and hopefully with enough of a different vibe from Goon Squad that it would that it would not just seem like an echo of it. And that didn't, I didn't really know for sure that I would do that mm -hmm. until maybe 2019 or so. Are you done Am I done with them? No. <laughs> I mean, you can say you're on book tour now. Does this mean you're <laughs> yeah, writing exactly. in green rooms for the next book? Well, you know, there are a few things that that really motivated me to to um, to keep working in on this material. One was curiosity about people, often characters who seemed the most opaque. That was, or sometimes the most alienating. Um, I have that still about certain characters. Another is a wish to try new things formally and structurally, and I have that wish as well. And this is a good arena in which to do it because one of the you know, organizing principles of the book is that I try, I use a different, um, a different craft approach in each chapter. So those two elements are, are in place still. The real question is just, can I do anything very good? And that remains to be seen. Um, and and I, you know, as 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 I've said, I'm very willing to walk away from from large efforts if they're if they're not working. So that's that's where I just don't know. That's the 
the blindness of my method means that I often really don't know if things will work out until pretty far along. Do we have? There's back. one in front. There's one in back and then one in front. We'll get these let be the last two. Okay. Um, I really love the conversation. You're both brilliant. But I love the idea of like a candy house and nothing being free. And I was just wondering if like you think the opposite side of it, like giving freely without turning into like someone who's expecting something in return, whether it's like becoming like a grandiose giver or like you know, like a self pitying like martyr. Do you think that's possible? I don't know if I totally understand that question. Can do you? I, I just want to. I, it's fascinating, it's but I just want to make sure. Of, I'm, I think it's the you're trying to say the opposite of expecting something for free. Like the person who has the candy house. Like, do you think it's possible to? Oh, give away the candy. Yeah. Oh, I hope so. <laughs> I mean that that is that is the best in all of us to to actually give to give. I mean, I I. That's the kind of um, that's the kind of possibility that makes me the the generosity of human beings, which is certainly not always present, um, and and I think we are all always a mix of of generosity and and selflessness, but also selfishness and self interest, which you know, and and the will to survive, whatever that means. Um, those qualities are in all of us, but that. Generous spiritedness is, I think, really maybe our best quality, actually. And I, I believe in it and, and hope to express it and hope to encourage it wherever I see it. Absolutely. And Simon, you want to come down here? There's going to get our last question. This woman here. Thank you. Um, I had multiple laugh out loud funny moments in reading the book. And I just wanted to ask you about the role that humor plays in your writing and bringing it in. because. It was re there were some really good, good parts. Where I'm happy to hear that. I think we can all use a laugh. Yeah. Um, you know, humor is such a, a a strange thing. I am not that funny as a person. Um, I was interviewing Gish Jen recently, and I said, "Your book is so funny." You know, in a way, a similar question, and and she said, "Jen." I'm just funny. <laughs> and of course, the whole room laughed. And I thought, OK, that's not true of me. Um, I, I think that the reason, uh, first of all, I'm always happy to get to humor mm -hmm. in my work. And I think part of the reason I like to get there is that it's a sign that I'm doing the thing that I most love to do, which is write about things that are both utterly ludicrous and also plausible. That is my happy place, sort of occupying the middle of that paradox in which things are impossibly silly and outrageous, and yet they make sense. And I find that if I can stay there or if I can push events until I get to that point, humor is sometimes the side effect of it. And I am so happy to find it because it means I'm doing the thing I'm trying to do and also because I love to laugh, and, and who doesn't? And are you finding it funny when you're writing it? I usually am finding it funny, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I am finding it funny, and my, my, this, the feeling, the, the feeling like I want to laugh is a sign that I'm, I'm getting to that place where I want to be. So I, I push it. I'm always trying to push things as far as they'll go. And sometimes it's not funny enough. That's another reason things end up in the wastebasket and not in the book. But if I can get to that humor, it's a sign that something is working. Last question. Music plays a big role in your writing. Do you listen to music when you write? I or do not. Um, I don't listen to music because I find music, I listen to music very narratively. I'm always thinking about this, well, not always, but. I find myself thinking about structure, and I listen to music. Sometimes when I'm intrigued by the structure of, let's say, a song, I will think, <clears throat> I want to try to do this in fiction. Mm -hmm. So music for me is very narrative, and conversely, fiction is very musical. I mean, the, the sound and the rhythm of the language is a big part of what can give fiction power, and if, if we're not using it effectively as writers, we're missing an opportunity. So listening to music is too distracting in a way. It's mm. almost like trying to listen to a book while also writing a book. 
Um, however, music is very important to me, and I think about it a lot. Um, there's a song that I, that I wrote down on my list of things I wanted to try, hopefully someday. One of them was, use the structure of Nada Surf's paper boats. <laughs> that was just on my <laughs> list. And later I thought, what? I had to go back and mm -hmm. listen to the song, and then I thought, oh yes. I remember why I wanted to do that, because a, a hidden rhythm emerges halfway through the song and the lyrics end, and we realize that the song was actually always about that hidden, that recessed rhythm. And I thought, I want to do that in fiction. So I, it, 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 music is a source of a lot of narrative ideas for me. Have you ever written a song? No, and we're all lucky for it. <laughs> um, I don't read music, and I don't play an instrument, and I don't have a very good singing voice. Um, and when I try to describe music, I don't really have the words for it, but yet music is so important. And I think all the time about how fiction, you know, storytelling began as an oral tradition in my writing group to whom I dedicated this book. We only read aloud. Actually, there's no, there's nothing on the page. We listen, we have the experience, and we respond. And it's a guarantee that we are paying attention to the rhythm and the sounds, and that we are noticing the ways in which they are adding power to the material. We're going to listen to some music in a minute, but first, let's thank Jennifer Egan for her time. <laughs> And I want to remind people, Jennifer will be doing a book signing in the lobby at the end of the night. Make sure you stick around for that. If you don't already have a copy of The Canyon House, you can buy one thanks to our lovely booksellers, the Center for Fiction. Jennifer, thank you so much. It was a delight. Thank you all for coming. All right, given our, our two themes tonight, two of the themes tonight are authenticity and memory. Our next guest has a pretty solid relationship with both. Steve Earle is an inductee to the Nashville Songwriters Hall of Fame, a Grammy winner, the music director for the show Coal Country, which wrapped at the Public Theater last month. And this month, he'll release the album Jerry Jeff, a tribute to one of his musical mentors, musician Jerry Jeff Walker. Please welcome Steve Earle. It is nice to see you again. It's good to be seen. It beats the alternative. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about rapping Coal Country at the public. You know, the play began before the pandemic, and then we had to stop. Yeah. And then it came back. Well, it was, you know, we had this play that, you know, we, theater takes a long time. I came here to make music for theater, and, you know, I did a show with, um, I did a uh, score for a Richard Maxwell play. And I got at Soho Rep, and I got tricked into being in it. That took four years. Mm. And Coal Country was four years, and so I figured it out. It takes, theater takes four years. <laughs> it's been my experience so far. So, um, and when it's a career that you began when you were, you know, in your late 50s, it's kind of, that's kind of daunting. But um, I, uh, Coal Country, um, you know, Jessica Blank and Eric Jensen and I, we, we traveled to West Virginia, and we conducted these, the, the Public Theater Commission Coal Country. Mm -hmm. We went around with the idea to several companies and Oscar used this bit. And we went to, to uh, West Virginia, interviewed these people that, who were survivors. And that means people that were there and were not deep enough in the mine to be killed. You're talking about the branch Or the mine families of, the, of, of miners. And uh, every, touched everybody in this community. It was the worst disaster in a coal mine since the 70s. It killed 29 guys. And um, and it was by not a coincidence. This was the first non-union mine on that mountain. And for me, it fell into my lap as I was trying to figure out how to make a record that um, spoke to the mess we've got ourselves into, and everybody thinking they know what somebody that lives in a different part of the country and lives differently than they do, what their lives are like, and and why we don't think we have anything in common, and a way to try to maybe. There's got to be something that, that West Virginians have in common with New Yorkers, and, 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 it, and it was trade unionism. Mm. That was the strongest mm -hmm. union place in the country until the 90s. And, um, and, and then that changed overnight, and it changed these people's lives. And um, I just, we got it up, you know, took four years of workshopping it, got it up at the public theater. We opened on March 3rd, 2020. And so we closed on the 13th with everything else in town. 
And it was heartbreaking. And, you know, nobody knew if anything was ever going to happen again. I mm -hmm. think there was that kind of hopelessness. When, when I, I went to Tennessee, uh, I have a house there still, and I took my boy there because it seemed like the safest place to be at the beginning of it all. New York got to be safer really fast than we came back. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, um, it, it was just, uh, you know, we did it for Audible, um, a version of it. And we thought that might be it, but then Audible has jumped into the theater world, mm -hmm. and uh, they opened the theater. They, they they leased out the Manetta Lane Theater, and um, you know I was doing another project for Audible based on uh, this course that I teach at my songwriting camp, and um, the idea came up with Audible uh, because there's rules about not-for-profit theater. It was impossible for the public theater on its own to, to remount coal country because there were other productions in the behind queue. us and we had had a run in the sense that the actors were paid to the end of the run even though we didn't complete it. So everybody that hadn't had a performance, union rules, good rules, and um, everybody that hadn't had a performance yet, they were in line in front of us. So there was no way anytime soon coal country could go up again. And then Audible stepped in and said, well, what about us co-producing it? So we went back up at the Cherry Lane Theater and we ran for six weeks and we just closed. And we're getting ready to, I have to go out and tour this summer because that's my day job and, and I do have to go out and not a lot of money in, in off-Broadway theater either. So, um, um, but I, um, we are gonna do it one last time, uh, at least for the time being in uh, Beckley, West Virginia, which we've been hoping to do from the beginning. For 1,100 people, which would be the largest audience at one time, it'll all be West Virginians. And, and that's uh, next so week, we're, right? we're looking, that, that'll be next, next uh, a week from uh, with the 9th, May yeah. 9th. Wow. And it's going to be, uh, that's going to be, it's going to be a trip. So a lot of the reason that, that, that I, Jessica and Eric asked me to do this, they knew my music would lend itself to telling the story. It was also, they had to go do the interviews in West Virginia, and I talk like this, and they don't, and it <laughs> kind of helped, you know, in the beginning of the process. So we're looking forward to it. Jennifer has, has spoken in interviews about how concept albums inspire her, and that Visit from the Goon Squad was kind of like a concept album. You've, you've done them. What's it's kind of all I do, actually, yeah. to some degree. They're at least light concepts in nearly every album I've ever made. How are they useful? How is a concept a useful thing for a songwriter? <sighs> well, I think, it, to me, it, it has to do with um, the gen my generation, and I'm the younger end of that generation when it comes right down to, we grew up in a moment when, when pop music became art. And I'm not sure that's always been true. Or, you know, I, It may have been true at some time in the past, but I wasn't around for it. I kind of watched it happen. My theory has always been there's a moment in 1965 when Bob Dylan wants to be John Lennon, John Lennon wants to be Bob Dylan, and the lyrics alone, language alone, elevates rock and roll to an art form. And I really, mm -hmm. now, that's me voting for pulling for my tribe because I'm a lyricist, but, but, but I think there's some truth in it, mm -hmm. you know? And um, so I, I just don't know of any other way. That, the first record I spent my own money on, I had an uncle five years older, and I had my hand-to-me-downs from him, First record I had to go because he had left, you know, moved out, and by myself was Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, mm -hmm. and so I don't really know anything about albums that aren't concept albums, and I'm struggling now because that's not what the music business is. So I'm, I, I've, I've opted to stick with what I do, and my audience is, you know, your audience is getting older when the line's longer at the men's room than it is at the ladies' room at your shows, <laughs> and and I, I accept that, and there. Are, <laughs> There are some younger people um, that listen to my music. That's mainly come from the political stuff that I've written over uh -huh. the years. And I'm not a political writer. I just, because of the generation that I come from and, and because of the idea of the concept album as an art form, I, I think a political statement is, I just don't think they're out of bounds for mm -hmm. people that are entertainers. Um, you know, you get to pick and choose your entertainment. That's part of what's supposed to happen in a democracy anyway. And you can... You know, if I say something that pisses you off, you don't have to come to the show. So, and, and I've just kind of operated under that. And, and I am trying to entertain people, that first and foremost. I write way more songs about girls than I do about anything else, and it gets right down to it, because that's what works, and, and I know what my job is. And I think the job is empathy, too. I think it's, mm. people don't so much care about what you think, they care about, you know, what you think and what you feel that they can relate to. You know, the stuff, the, the feelings that we, no. People want to know they're not alone. Mm -hmm. I think that's what 
Well, we, have we, I think we've learned that about the art we've been consuming in the last two years, without a doubt. I mean, everybody, I think, read more, watched more television, what, you know, just, uh, and look, it, it isn't a bad thing right now at this moment in history watching that much TV, because arguably the best dramatic writing being done today is being done for television, because writers control mm -hmm. the medium. So, uh, I mean, I, I got to witness some of that. I've been lucky. I was in The Wire and Treme, and, and um, you learn a lot when you go out there and say words that guys like that write. Huh. You know, you learn a lot about writing when you get to go out and what, do that. What's something you noticed about the writing that on The um, Wire and well, thought, yeah. yeah. David Simon decided I was an actor, you know, not me. And he, he basically, he, he likes to use non-actors. Mm -hmm. he's, always, he's always done it. Um, <laughs> I figure out that... Um, I think I'm a better performer when I actually go out and sing my songs. I inhabit them mm -hmm. better than I did before I'd done any acting. Uh, of course, that's, that's, you know, my first acting gig, I, I played a redneck recovering addict. It required absolutely no acting when I got right <laughs> down to it. But, but just to go out there and try to, <clears throat> you know, tr try to present something in 3D rather than, you know, just words on a page mm -hmm. or words that you're singing. And, and, and I think I just learned how to sort of be the person that's speaking to you in the song in a more convincing way than I did before I'd actually, you know, done any acting. Later this month, you'll be releasing a covers album, well, more like a tribute album, to Jerry Jeff Walker. Yeah. Why is Jerry Jeff Walker important to you? Well, it com completes a set. Um, Guy. Towns Van Zandt, Guy Clark, Jerry Jeff Walker. They were the first. I grew up in Texas. And I started out playing coffee houses because my dad wouldn't let me have an electric guitar. And I, and I started going out and playing when I was 14 or 15, and I couldn't get into places that served liquor. So I hung out, and there were coffee houses around, and I hung out. And I mean, Jerry Jeff Walker came to Texas, wrote Mr. Bojangles mm -hmm. in an in a apartment above a coffee house in Houston, Texas, in 1968 that Towns Van Zandt lived in and because uh, he was a couch surfer he didn't like to pay for hotel rooms and when he was on the, on the folk circuit in those days and he's he's all of our all of us in Texas he's our connection to Greenwich Village because Jerry Jeff Walker was born in Oneonta New York and he migrated down here it was part of the National Coffee House circuit and, and part of the village scene you know the second wave of folkies in, in Greenwich Village Fred Neal was his mentor. He followed Fred mm -hmm. Neal, who wrote Everybody's Talking and was, you know, the hoot master at the Cafe Wa for years. Fred Neal went to Coconut Grove. Jerry Jeff followed him down mm -hmm. there. Then um, he he went to Key West from there, got kicked out of Key West. And Ooh, that takes how do you talent. do that? I don't know, <laughs> but he did. And he ended up in Austin, Texas, and he became so much a part of Texan culture just at the moment as I was getting out on my own. Mm. Um, that he's buried in the state cemetery. And he's, um, you know, he, Guy, and Towns came up together, and the, the three of them were the first people I could sit across from the time I was 17 years old, sit across, you know, rather than being people that I listened to on records, all of a sudden my heroes were guys that I could sit across the room from in the middle of the night with a guitar going around. So I made the Towns record about 10 years after he passed away, the guy record the year after he passed, and Jerry Jeff passed last year, and so it was real obvious that I had to make a, a record of Jerry Jeff Walker songs. So that was that, that it's called Jerry Jeff, and it mm -hmm. comes out in a couple of weeks. We're going to go. I feel like you want to take a drink of water, and I keep, I do. I keep I, asking you questions, and you don't get I've, a chance I've, to. I've, I got an airplane. I, I had to go to, I was in Austin for Willie Nelson's 89th birthday last night. So. Wow. Okay, you buried the lead on that. William Nelson's day. Yeah. <laughs> That's where you were yeah. last night? Yeah, he, he, I, I, I was asked to come, a lot of us, me, Cheryl Crow, um, Robert O'Kane, and a bunch of other people, to perform at Willie's um, Luck, Texas, it's called. It's mm -hmm. like a western town basically in his backyard that was built for the red-headed stranger that, for the filming of that movie. And there's a kind of a boutique festival called Luck Reunion that happens there every year. It's kind of the anti-South by Southwest. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but this was Willie... A lot of us performing Willie songs for two hours, and then Willie came out and did an hour set. Wow. And uh, <clears throat> I'll be out on the road with him this summer. I'm doing two of the Outlaw Country tour shows and the Fourth of, Fourth of July picnic in Austin this summer. So uh, I'm um, Willie Nelson's a big deal to me too. Not not any doubt about it. No doubt. I actually went to Robert Earl Keene's farm in Bandera, Texas, 
Oh, did you really? Time. Ken and I go back a long way. We, He's he, a good he dude. He see the show last night. He uh, he came to Nashville for a very short period of time. There's a hamburger chain in Texas called Whataburger, and he, it's a it's sort of a big deal culturally if you're from Texas and you're someplace else. And they had one for a, mu- a minute in Nashville, and we made a pilgrimage out to Nolensville Road to the only Whataburger in town to get a jalapeno cheeseburger every Sunday for two years. The <laughs> whole time he was there. So. That's where I learned what bullheaded actually meant. Yeah. Because we drove up on his farm and two bulls were going at it. Yep. And stayed that way for like two hours. Yeah. yeah. Push yeah. I was like, bullheaded. That's it. That's it. That's it. We're going to go full circle. You're working on a Broadway show. I, I am. I am. I am writing a musical, A Tender Mercies with Daisy Foote. And I started on it about a year ago and, you know, doing it virtually. Um, it's kind of a perfect for me you know because i mean i i i know mac i know the character if you've ever seen it's about a alcoholic uh washed up songwriter that pops up in this little wide place on the road in texas and and this widow takes him in he gets sober and uh, i know a, a little bit about this character and i can um it's just i've written some of the best songs i've ever written for it already we uh-huh. pretty much I'm about two songs away from the first act being written, and we should, after I get off the road in September, start workshopping in earnest here in the city when I get back in September. So what year did you start that? Huh? What year did you start writing that? You said four years. I'm kind of figuring out. Oh, yeah, it'll be four, yeah, and we're a year in, so that makes, we got, it'll be three. <laughs> That's what I'm hoping. This right. is not, um, I mean, <laughs> some people I know that I love in, in not-for-profit theater in New York City were, are, are really interested in this piece, but the agents involved don't want not-for-profit theater anywhere near it. It's, <laughs> it's got to be in room for a Broadway track, and, and I'm ready for that. I'm, I'm 67 years old, and I want to hit Broadway show before I die, so I need right. to get going on it. All right. That's all there is to it. Could you play some music for us? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Yeah. I'm going to get out of the way. Steve Earle, everybody. try to get a guitar and start doing this before I get myself in trouble. Uh, let's see. Uh, this doesn't quite fit. Sorry about that. Otherwise, it'll be... Um, so, uh... You guys got this? Stop mine. As long as I got in the guitar. Can you hear the guitar okay? So, um, Coal Country was uh, about an explosion at a mine called Upper Big Branch that happened 12 years ago. Mont Cole, West Virginia. And it was front page news for about 30 seconds if you were up early in the morning, the day after the explosion, and you probably saw folks on all the news shows, all the network ones, all the cable news shows, talking. There were, you know, a few people that were talking to all of them. You know, some people didn't want to talk about it. 29 guys died, and somebody, there was nobody in that part of West Virginia that wasn't related to at least one of them. One of the guys you definitely would have seen was a guy called Tommy Davis. And Tommy was angry that morning because he was talking because Tommy was there. He was up top. And he lost his son, his brother, and a nephew in an instant. But Tommy was talking because he wanted answers. Love me in the eyes when you're talking to me. Wanna see in your soul when you lie. Don't try and tell me that you couldn't foresee what everybody reckons was a matter of time. Goddamn right, I'm emotional. I ain't nothing but a man. Hell yes, it's personal. Before you leave here, you're gonna understand. It's about fathers. It's about sons. It's about lovers waking up in the middle of a night alone. It's about muscle, it's about bone, it's about a river running thicker than water, and it's about blood.
once upon a time in America a working man knew where he stood and nowadays just getting by is a miracle probably wouldn't give it up if I could Trapped him about the state of the economy fiscal reality profit and law none of that matters when you're underground anyway damn sure can't tell me nothing about cost it's about fathers it's about sons it's about lovers waking up in the middle of the night alone it's about muscle it's about bone it's about a river running thick of land water and it's about blood Tell yourself it was an accident, isolated incident, part of the job. Yeah, we'll tell that to the families, kids of that daddies, and tell it to God. Is that the wind you hear howling through the holler? Or the ghost of a widow that cried for every man that died for a coal company dollar? Lung full of dust and a heart full of lies. It's about fathers, it's about sons, it's about lovers waking up in the middle of a night alone. It's about muscle, it's about bone, it's about a river running to cut down water, and it's about blood. It's about Pee Wee Acord, Jason Atkins, Christopher Bell, Greg Brock, Kenny Chapman, Robert E. Clark. Timmy Davis, Corey Davis, Michael Lee Ellswick, Bob Griffith, Stephen Hera, Dean Jones, Rick Lane, William Roosevelt Lynch, Nicholas Darrell McCroskey, Joe Markle, Ronald Lee. I do have those names on a piece of paper, and I had them on my guitar, and we used a teleprompter to make sure, because I, one thing I could never live with, I, I don't have any trouble memorizing songs. I haven't quite tested positive for teleprompter when it comes to my own shows, but I'm terrified of leaving one of those names out, so I have to do that. So... Um, Um, the new record is called Jerry Jeff. The Guy Clark record was called Guy, and the Towns record was called Towns. <laughs> so it was a that was a no brainer. And I wanted to Jerry Jeff was famous for interpreting other people's songs too, and especially people in Texas knew him as much for some songs that he didn't write as he did the ones he did write, but I wanted to make the record, the main album, all songs that he had written going back to 1968 to his first record, a lot of which were written in this neighborhood right here and played on this radio station from the first places that this song, I think the first time it was ever heard on the radio was right here live. It's, uh, it's one of those songs, um, it's one of the songs I've been singing longer than any other song. Um, I did it in a play in high school in 1969, long before Jerry Jeff had a cowboy hat or was living in Texas. And a guy named Vernon Carroll, my drama teacher, wanted me to learn it for, we were doing a production of The World of Carl Sandburg, and he thought we would fit this song into the show, and we did. So it's the second song I think I ever played in front of an audience of more than three or four. The first one was As Tears Go By. 
It's a uh, pretty special. It's one of those songs so many people have recorded it. I did it the other night on the Grand Ole Opry, and I'd always known the song was special, but I did it on the Grand Ole Opry last Saturday night, and I looked up in the balcony. And it's a little over 3,000 seats in that room. And every cell phone light in the place was open upstairs. And by the time I finished, they were half the downstairs was lit up. And that just happened because of it's just the way this song is. It fits into a lot of people's lives in a lot of ways. I knew a man bojangles in and dance for you. And one I choose. Silver hair, a ragged shirt, and bag of pants. The old soft shoe. And jump so high, jump so high. And they light the touchdown. Met a man of selling New Orleans or was down and out. He looked to me to be the very eyes of each and it spoke right out. He talked a lot. Talk to life. Laughed and slapped his leg a step. Said his name, Bojangles, and it danced a leg. Across the cell. Grabbed his pants full of feathers, danced in the jumps of Clicked his heels. Let go, laugh, let go, laugh. Shook his clothes back all around. Mr. Bojangles. Mr. Bojangles, Mr. Bojangles, Shows and kind of bears to out the south. Talked in tears of fifteen years, has dogging him. Traveled about dog up and died, a lot of them died. After 20 years, he still grieves. He said, not dance at every chance in the honky tonks. Drinks and tips. But most of my time is spent behind these county bars. Cause I drink a bit. Shook his head and as he shook his head 
Has someone ask him please? Please, Mr. Bojangle, Mr. Bojangle, Mr. Bojangle. Thanks so much to Steve Earle, of course. Thanks to Jennifer Egan, who will be signing books out in the lobby. Uh, I want to tell you about our May book, but I do want to thank some people because we're polite around here. Thanks to our partners at the New York Public Library, Tony Marks, Brian Bannon, and Andrew Medlar, who get those e-books into your hands. Well, not your hands, onto your device. Um, also, thanks to all the folks at the Green Space. It is so great to be back. Jennifer, Ricardo, Amber, and Emma. And thanks to our producers, part of Team All of It, that works on Get Lit. That is Megan Ryan, not that one, Jordan Loff, and Simon Close. OK, here's our May book, everybody. The author's first novel was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. It's set here in New York. Kirkus calls it a clever and affecting high-concept novel. We are reading Trust by Hernan Diaz. E-copies will be available to New Yorkers starting tomorrow. It is so good to see you all. Thank you so much for coming out. Be well, be safe, and have a good night. <laughs>